To some, the Newfoundland wilderness is a raw, forbidding place that still bears the scars of the last ice age. To others, it's a place of exquisite beauty. Caribou roam this land, more now than in living memory. Moose, too, are numerous in the Newfoundland wilderness. The abundant wildlife and the great stretches of country in which these great animals roam. We take it all for granted, don't we? We're lucky. Our island is so vast and we are so few. It's not the same on every island. Over seven million people are jammed together here on this tiny island they call New York City. And there are many millions more in the other urban jungles on the eastern seaboard of the United States. Traffic, concrete, bustle, tall buildings reaching to the sky. An exciting place in which to live, but a frantic pace of life. Meet Bill Vosper, Jr., attorney at law. This is his life, rushing from client to courtroom, negotiating, fighting legal battles. This is one of Bill's clients, businessman John Crimmy. Cagey and tense now, every nerve taut. They maneuver their way through some delicate legal proceedings. Next time we see them, the collars and ties will be gone, and they'll be maneuvering through moose country. Back in the New Jersey countryside, James Young, who owns a construction company, is also hard at work. Is he coming to Newfoundland this fall? Try to stop him. Down the road a ways, Dr. Bill Vosper relaxes in his country home. He's the father of the lawyer we met a moment ago. At 75, he's determined to make at least one more trip to Newfoundland with Billy and the boys. It's a long way from New Jersey to Newfoundland, but the Americans we've just met have all been here before. They're regular customers of Gene Plowman, who has now fulfilled the boyhood dream of becoming an outfitter. I enjoyed the country myself, and uh, always wanted to be able to take people in and uh, have a lodge or two in the country, and to be in the wilderness where you had to fly in and, and fly out again, and, uh, and that's what we have now. We operate the charter service as well as the outfitting service and uh, put it all together, it makes for a fairly active operation. Americans pay handsomely for the privilege of hunting in Newfoundland. They bring a lot of money to the province and create employment for guides and outfitters. But for Gene Plowman, this is more than a business trip. Uh, I've known those fellows now, Dave, for the last five or six years. They've been coming into our lives, the same group, each time. And, uh, well, they're friends of ours now. Uh, we, we know them personally, and uh, we, we think very highly of them. At least two of those fellows have been back now at least five times. And uh, that, well, we must be doing something right, if that's the case. <laughs> that's great. You must be rich. Gene yes. Plowman, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh. Good to see you, Bill. Oh, my God, you're looking good. And Dr. Vosper, nice to see you again. How are you? Fine. That's good. I don't know, but that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks like you got a fair amount of gear, boys. Yeah, well, you got to load in there already, huh? Yeah, well, we'll just take everything out now. We'll and, We'll get everything on the way. I'm not accustomed to big cities, uh, but I know that those people, a lot of them just live in, uh, in the bigger centers, and I guess they see concrete and pavement and, uh, and smoke and smog for uh, 11 and a half months of the year, and they have a lot of pressures uh, at work and dealing with people all the time, and to get up here just among a smaller group uh, 
get into wilderness then again where there's no roads, uh, no other access except by airplane, uh, it must be a real treat for those fellows. We're accustomed to it, of course, and uh, just takes it for granted. Island Pond, about 50 miles inland from Shoal Harbor, about as remote from civilization as you can be in Newfoundland. It's here that Gene Plowman built his lodge. We, we just cut the logs right out of the country, and uh, I used to fly in here in the morning, leave about 5 o'clock in the morning, fly in and cut the logs, and fly back again and go to work in, in the afternoon. And That's the way I cut all the logs, and then over periods of time, we put, put it together, hired on carpenters, and uh, it's, it's been uh, seven years now since we started, but we can finally say now it's finished. The guides are there, waiting to greet the hunters. Again, it's more like a reunion of old friends. For these men have shared many an experience together here in the wilderness. A few years ago, this was just a remote droke of overmature trees on the edge of a lake. Now it's a comfortable lodge from which Gene and his guides can show hunters the time of their lives. If we put an awful lot of work and, uh, and effort into it, it's, it's after costing a fortune. And uh, uh, we believe, of course, that we provide a, a good place for those people and uh, provide a good service with good food, then uh, they'll keep coming back. If they don't come back, uh, their friends will come back. We have a full-time cook for all non-resident parties, and uh, that's, that's his job only, uh, to cook. And uh, he tries to make sure that we have a variety of food. Uh, we uh, always have fresh salmon for them. Uh, we freeze it in the freezer during the summer months and have it for the fall, and, uh, and other seafood, such as scallops and codfish, and things that they don't normally get where, where, they, uh, where they come from. Those fellows come back every day after a, a, a long day on the trail, and they want a good uh, hot meal. And uh, like the chief said, most of them just roll away from the table. <laughs> good food, laughter, talk of moose and caribou and bears, plans for the morrow, for the first day on the country. It's cool, it's misty, it's early. It's the start of another hunting trip in the Newfoundland wilderness. It's an expedition that Bill Vosper dreams about all year long back home in New Jersey. It's terrific. Yeah, I think it's the, it's the most fun I've ever had hunting is going to Newfoundland. And I've been, around, you know, I've, like I said, I've hunted all over. Dennis is a fantastic guide. He's probably one of the best I ever came across. I've been hunting in Wyoming and different places throughout the United States, the Everglades, Louisiana. And, uh, I never saw a guide that was that attuned to where he was in nature and, uh, as Dennis. And Jimmy Young, who goes with us, um, uh, he, he has a fantastic sense of humor. And he just uh, he came the third year, and he's just added uh, a lot of relaxation and a lot of fun to the whole trip, too. After cruising the pond for a while, they decide they'll take to the country. Walking this spongy ground takes some getting used to. They're soon rewarded, though. A cow moose with twin calves. They're permitted to shoot only bulls, so the hunters watch as the moose family saunters off. For Bill and James and Dennis, the first day will be a day of walking and looking. But not so for the Crimmy brothers up on the ridge. Guide Bob Harnham has brought them to a fine young bull. Now, we had a variety of Americans on this trip. Um, we had uh, John Crimmy, who was uh, a client of mine, and his brother. They were on a trip, and um, 
and they are real hunters uh, as far as the main purpose of their of going to Newfoundland is to hunt and they go up and they hunt eight hours a day or nine hours a day and every day that they're there they hunt hard and they don't stop hunting and walking the whole time. Well, how are you doing, Peter? Hey. Weston, how are you? Congratulations. Thank you. Is, is this for real? This is for real. Well, look at that. This is for real. Buy all the book. Well, take it off. I appreciate it. Well, Jim, how are you doing? I'm in trouble here. Oh, oh boy. We belong to the Ridge Runner. The Ridge Runner Club. Runner's club. <laughs> I'm a I member. understand you got the dandy ball. Yeah. Congratulations, Jim. Well, thank you very much. Oh, boy, it looks like a beauty. Yeah. Real beauty. You got the caribou. Oh, that was here last year. Oh, that was, that was, uh, I know. It's coming out of the woods. No, oh, well, remember that? <laughs> so, boys, how did everything go? No, nice sure. That's good. You got blood on your uh, jacket, uh, Bill, so. Oh, my God. Yeah, no bleed. Yeah, no bleed. So, when do you get this one, Peter? About 3.30. Very yeah. good. Well, well, that's a nice little rack. Yeah, that's nice. What do you want to do? Have that mounted? Well, you just like that. Yeah, yeah. It's just right. like that. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Looks really good. Cool. Yeah. Before we went up to look for those moose, uh, John said there was two shots, and it sounded over this way. Not now. Well, I never heard Back in the camp, the excitement is far from over. So anyway, there are stories to tell and experiences to share. This is all important to the guides, for they've got to plan where they'll go and what they'll do the next day. From the sound of it, there's no shortage of game here at Island Pond. There's a lot of moves in that ridge garden to that. Seems there must be. Another day. Another hike. A long day of tramping and looking. I think one of the biggest things for, for hunting in Newfoundland is a good pair of glasses and uh, being able to to constantly scope the landscape for uh, for animals. I think that you can't just be looking at at fresh tracks because there's fresh tracks all over the place. You have to you have to be able to see and you definitely need um, uh, binoculars. Finally, a young bull. James takes careful aim. And down goes the moose. Gene's guides are always impressed with the marksmanship of most American sportsmen. They have the best of rifles, and they know how to use them. Though the heads and antlers are important to non-resident hunters, the meat must not be wasted. It must be carried out. Yep. And that's not an easy job, for some of the animals are huge. This is one of the reasons Gene Plowman would like to see more caribou licenses made available to non-resident hunters. Each outfitter is allocated a certain number of licenses each year, and it's up to that outfitter to encourage the clients to come to his lodge. So of course, uh, uh, the better facility you have uh, and the better hunt that you provide, uh, naturally, the, the more your place will be booked up. There is a limit. In our case, it's uh, 10 moose hunters uh, plus two caribou. Uh, uh, we think it should be certainly more caribou because t two caribou in that area of approximately 11,000 is uh, uh, certainly not very many. Caribou, of course, is a much, uh, it's a much nicer hunt to my mind. The caribou are, are not as big and bulky as a moose. They're a lot prettier animal when they're mounted. And uh, it's a lot less work for the guides and, uh, and for me to have to bring out the meat. Each year, thousands of moose and caribou are shot by hunters, the vast majority by Newfoundlanders. Some hunt for sport, but the most for meat. It's estimated that we consume four million pounds of moose meat a year. Now, off with its legs. A 
A walk through the Newfoundland wilderness is hard enough. A walk with 100 pounds or more of moose meat on your back will test your heart, your lungs, and your legs. Bill Vosper knows it takes a special kind of hunter to go on a moose hunt in Newfoundland. Just twist this one around his shoulder. It has to be somebody that's willing to put, put up with the endurance um, required, especially to get a moose out. I mean, there's... Every time I wonder whether I'm going to make it to the canoe, <laughs> I'm carrying the moose out. And uh, I feel my old heart pounding, and I usually can get one quarter out, and that's it. And I watch these Newfoundlanders go back for seconds and thirds. In fact, I was carrying Jimmy Young's a part, a part of his moose out last year, and um, I fell down into a crevice, and the, the whole quarter fell on my back. And I couldn't have gotten out of there. If they hadn't pulled the quarter off of my back, I would have been stuck. <laughs> What do you think of it, Bill? It's just clear I really need a lot. <laughs> Evening comes, and the last of the hunters trudge home. They're bone weary now and ravenously hungry. The trip will soon be over. It'll soon be time to head back home to the States. It's been a good hunt. It's been a real tonic to spend a week here in the Newfoundland wilderness, away from it all. It's been a busy time for the chief and for the guides. The hunt is nearly over now, but effervescent Bill is still enjoying himself to the hill. Well, they love the country. It seems that way anyway. Most people uh, uh, who do come, say they'd like to come back. Uh, most of them are, are successful. As a matter of fact, this year, you know, it's been up around 95% success, and the year before, the same thing, and uh, uh, that's part of the trip for those people, of course. Once they are successful, it, uh, it makes them go back happy and, uh, and makes us happy as well. Thank you, thank you. There'll be lots to remember, lots to talk about this winter, among the guides here in Newfoundland, and among the hunters back home in New Jersey. Yeah. November. The hunted island pond is now another fond memory. Life goes on in the big city. But strangely enough, there are quiet places here in New York and New Jersey. When you get away from the big cities, you'll find peaceful, secluded woodland. There are lots of deer and pheasants and even wild turkeys in these woods. In places like this, it's hard to believe you're only a couple of hours from Manhattan. It's in this kind of country where our American hunters have chosen to live. Dr. Vosper, a retired dentist, lives here in this warm and elegant home. It's apparent that hunting has been important to Dr. Vosper. His study is filled with trophies, with a lifetime of memories. New Jersey has changed a lot since he was a boy. That's why he invested in this large country estate. You see, there's no more open land to hunt. So the state is, uh, they put what they call public hunting grounds. And the average hunter today that has no place to go goes on the, up, on the hunting grounds. And uh, they're usually crowded. You know, you go up there, you get a good chance of being shot. And I mean, it's like a war. If you stand back when these guys run in, these hunters, you think you were in Vietnam someplace, bang, 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 all over the place, you know, you don't wonder where this. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, a friend of mine got shot in the face. He had glasses on, and the pellet hit him just below the glasses, standing in the road talking to me. So we decided to forget this. We got out of there. I guess that's why a lot of Americans go to Canada, because it's so crowded down Well, there. that's true. And the deer hunting here, <clears throat> is uh, <clears throat> limited now to farms like this and other places where they, it's all posted and <clears throat> they don't let strangers on. 
So really you've got your own hunting preserve right here. Yeah, very luckily. Yeah. And we have uh, probably about, I would imagine a thousand or more acres of different, couple different farms all in one club. Dr. Vosper's son, Bill, lives not far away in this beautiful home that dates back to colonial times. He too owns a farm and a large tract of land. It's an escape from the pressures of his job, a retreat. It's the kind of place in which he wants to live. I love living on a farm and I love uh, hunting and I can hunt and fish right here at my own place and um, just walk out my door and go bow and arrow hunting in the morning before I go to work. And, uh, uh, and I love animals, so um, that's another reason why I'm here. There are lots of deer here and pheasants. These birds are raised in captivity and released to the wild each year. Bill, his dad, and his son Ira often go pheasant hunting together. A typical day is, is that we get up in the morning at uh, uh, 5 30, 6 o'clock, and uh, get the dogs and either go to my father's place or come to my place. I heard a pheasant. You hear it? Yeah. And on his place, there's a gun club that lets pheasants Come loose, on, so he has his pheasants over there. And here, uh, I let pheasants loose, but we also have um, uh, uh, woodcock that are wild and Canadian geese to fly in that we hunt and, um, and rabbits. Uh, the pheasants are usually in the swampy areas, in what we call multiflora rose bushes, uh, which the state had originally planted uh, to be used instead of barbed wire fences. That uh, they figured that these rose bushes would grow along the fence lines, and farmers wouldn't have to put up barbed wire fences to keep their animals in. However, they've uh, gotten out of control, and they're all over the place now. And uh, they do make a nice protective area for the pheasants to hide in. Seeing young Ira with his father brings back strong memories. The hunting tradition is strong in the Vosper family. I used to walk next to him during the deer season, just like my son does. And I remember him saying, you know, get behind a tree or hit the ground when the deer start going through and the buck starts, buckshot starts flying. Uh, there's been more than one occasion when people have gotten hit with buckshot. That's got to be crummy. That has to be crim. I hope he gets something. He'll have a sour look on his face if he doesn't. What's that? And I think both my father and myself get the same pleasure of watching uh, the pleasure that uh, Ira has out of this. And uh, he's been deer hunting with us, um, I guess, since he's been. Since he could walk three years old, uh, he not hunting not with a gun, but he was on the drives with me. We drive the deer here. And he would walk next to me through the woods just like I did with my father when I was about five years old. I have a German short-haired pointer um, that uh, uh, I think has the potential to be an excellent hunting dog. He does point and he can find the birds without any trouble at all. That's a good boy, yes! There you go. Everyone is attached to their own dog, and I love my dog, and I think he's a good dog. Nice bird, isn't it? Yeah. Well, with the hunting so as good as it is here, why bother to go to Newfoundland for a big game? Well, um, first of all, we don't have uh, caribou or moose here is one of the reasons. And uh, uh, I just haven't, you know, it's, it's a real change. And it's, I think it's terrific hunting up there. And the, the terrain is totally different, which is a nice change. And I think everyone needs a change in life. And that's uh, one of the reasons for, uh, for going there. Um, um, Plus, I uh, really think the people are out of this world. They're very friendly and uh, open their doors to everyone and uh, love to sit down and chat. And uh, I have a good time uh, when I'm up there, not only hunting, but socializing before I go in to go hunting and when I come out. And um, 
it's a unique place, I think, Newfoundland, more so than any place in the world. I don't think there's anything like it any place. Uh, 